So today we are going to talk about four tips that will help us to design better RESTful APIs. Over the past 17 years, I've spent countless hours building APIs from simple corporate CRUD stuff to complex public facing APIs. And let me tell you that during that time, I've learned that the devil is in the details. It's those small decisions that can make your API extremely hard to change. And across those years, I have learned some lessons that even nowadays I apply to design easy to use and simple RESTful APIs. And it's about those that we'll be talking in this video. Okay, and let's start with the first one object responses instead of arrays. A common thing that we'll see in the response of collection endpoints is that they often return a JSON array. And to this type of response is what we call an end cuff response. Why? If one day you need to evolve this output, this response, you can do it. Imagine that now you want to build list and pagination on top of this, and you'd love to return for example, the total number of entries in the database. Or for example, you want to list there in the payload the arguments used to filter the collection. Now we can't do it, okay? We are locked to this response. We can't put things around that collection. So what can we do instead? Our end goal is to build a response that will let us to make changes in the future that are backward compatible. So the first tip is that you should move that collection inside of an object response. So you will create an object that will work as a kind of an envelope around that collection entry. This simple decision will allow us to, in the future, bring new properties into that response, like the total number of records that I mentioned. That, by the way, is something that you should be careful with, and if you want to know why, just drop a comment. And since we are talking about collections, let's go to the tip number two, flat collections. You might have seen some endpoints working like this one, where a given value is used as an index to access a given collection. A common case is using, for example, the username of a given user to, as an example, to access all the tasks of that user. So the top level of your response will come with, for example, the username, and that username gives you access to a given object, that object has the collection inside. This is something that even some time ago you could find in many public APIs of things like Facebook. And when you see a contract like this one, it's clear that the authors of that API have a user case, a, a flow in mind when they designed the API. So it was created with the assumption on this case that I would segregate the data by user. And for that data access pattern, it makes a lot of sense to do things this way. However, what if I don't want to do that in that way? What if I want to build a list organized by priority, as an example? What if I want to list all the tasks independent of the user by due date? I want to find the ones that I need to finish today. So now clearly, a decision that was made to facilitate a given data access pattern now is creating problems for another implementation. So instead, what you can do is to have always flat collections. What does that mean? It means that every single thing is together in a single collection. And you move that property that you were using as the accessor to the collection, in the case, the owner or the username, of that task, you move it inside of the collection object. This simple decision might not be the most convenient way to use if you want to favor the other access pattern, like give me everything for a given user. However, this one will resist to change. It's easier to bring new functionality and also facilitates the multiple types of use cases that will be built in the future on top of this collection and we can't predict them, to be honest. So this is the tip number two. Organize collections in a flat list. Don't try to be smart and try to predict how they will be used. As tip number three, make sure you don't confuse identity with name. In the past, I have tried to design APIs that were extremely readable. 
every single access value was something human readable. The goal is that if a given user wanted to grab some information from the system, it will be able to quickly type the input values. So I've tried to avoid using global and unique identifiers or ints to identify a given resource. And when you look into an API like this one, it's delightful. In terms of usability, it's amazing, let's, let's face it. It might look like an attractive thing to do. However, there's a lot of problems involved. Why? Because identity isn't the same thing as name. So by saying Guy doesn't mean that it's me. Guy might be a name that I'm recognized for, but it doesn't define me. So if I want to bring another endpoint as an example of members, what if I have another Guy? What if I need to change that name? All of that will bring a lot of problems. And when I try to build an API like this, I start with the, the wrong call in mind. I was trying to design an API for a common user to open something like Postman and quickly type the endpoints and use the API. I was expecting that a common user would be using something like Swagger to interact with the API. However, that's not a typical use case. In 99% of the APIs, a common user will not interact with them. The only manual interaction that usually you will have is in the first phase when a given developer that is a consumer of that API is still exploring the API. Once it's coded, it doesn't care about the names. It only cares about implementing the logics. Okay? If you give him an ID, it's more than enough for him to build the request that he needs to do. So instead of using names, don't be afraid of using IDs. And rule number four, always look for conventions and standards. In the past, I have tried multiple times to be clever when building my endpoints, or even I didn't look for what was the typical way of doing something. Eventually, I have learned that many already had the discussions that I was having, and I quickly realized that consuming my API should be exactly the same as consuming any other API. So if I learn to use a given API, and during that process, I have to learn what is a resource. I have to learn what's the impact of a verb. I need to learn what means a given HTTP status code. I should be able to transfer that knowledge into other APIs. So if I want to create an healthy API, something that is easy to use, I should offer to the consumers what they are expecting. So my point with this tip is that you should be specific with those rules. If there's a standard or a convention to do something in a given way, do it. So don't limit yourself to reply a 200 OK. Go take a look into when to use a 201, when to use a 202, or even when to use a 303. As an example, many of us already implemented an endpoint to check the status of something without even checking what's the typical status code to respond on those cases. Does that mean that you can take those decisions always by the book? Unfortunately, no. And there are some corner cases like this one. Imagine this endpoint. I can call the members endpoint and provide the filter of the role of that team member. So I want all the members that are an advocate. Now I want you to think about the following scenario. What if I don't find any single member with this row. What should be the response? Should it be a 200 with an empty collection? Or since I didn't find anyone, I should return a 404 in the same way that you do when you try to access a given resource and it doesn't exist? Or should it be a 204? So I return basically saying, it's okay, the request succeeded, but there's no content for this. In many of those cases, what you should do is to look into the standards in the conventions, but then think about which approach is the best to favor the usability of your API. Is in your space any other common API that your consumers are using that has this type of problem already solved? How they do it? So remember that REST APIs are basically APIs on top of the HTTP protocol that are designed in line to respect that protocol. So the protocol doesn't need to go 
to some levels of details of our conventional APIs that we do nowadays. So when you get into those corner cases, think about the best experience for your consumers. One thing that I like to do when designing my APIs is to first type the endpoints and the responses, the status codes in a simple file where I can take a look and understand if it's clear the intent and how to use that API. And I recently found that this tool that I mentioned in this video is an amazing tool to do that. So take a look into that video where we will see not only that, but how I am using that tool to replace Postman in my day-to-day.